Good morning to everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome. Uh, we are certainly glad for each one that's here and for your taking the time to listen to this lesson. Uh, before we get started, let me make just a few comments, not really announcements, but just some things I'll say while I have you all here. Um, the month of July, next month, we have our special program, Family Time Thursdays. Every Thursday of the month at 6 p.m., uh, we'll be meeting up here. Dinner will be provided. We're going to have some good Bible lessons. We're going to have a good time of fellowship together. Uh, I want to invite and encourage every one of you to take part in that. Thursdays in July at 6. Uh, also, let me say, today is a special Sunday because we'll be leaving for Camp Ida. Uh, some of you have been before. Uh, many of you have not. Uh, maybe you don't know a lot about Camp Ida. When you think of camp, you might think of archery and canoes. That's not Camp Ida. Which is not to say we don't have fun. We have fun, we play games. But I want to assure you, it is a Bible-based camp. Uh, each day begins with a morning devotional, a portion from God's Word. Each day ends with an evening devotional, another portion of God's Word. Uh, throughout the day, we have a singing session. We have two Bible class sessions broken up into age groups. Each day, we have a worship service together uh, with full-length sermons there presented. It is a time of spiritual education. Uh, our theme for camp this year is all about getting to know God. And so all the Bible classes are based on the I Am statements of Jesus, and then each one of the sermons is based on one of the attributes of God, trying to get to know God better, to understand God, and to be able to tell others. Uh, we always look forward to camp. It's a wonderful time to be away from a lot of the distractions of the world, a lot of the evil that we see paraded around in TV and music and in other places, and to just dig into God's Word. Uh, so we really are looking forward to it. Uh, my topic that I was assigned at camp is the same topic that I'll be addressing here with you today. See how I did that? Double it up. Today's lesson is entitled, God is Unchanging. Uh, it is certainly one of the attributes of God to talk about how He doesn't change, how He is consistent. Uh, when you think about it, there are a lot of words that we could use to describe God. Uh, some are a lot more exciting than others. One of the most popular and most well-known, God is love. Uh, we talk about that all the time, and we love that about our God, that He is love. That's part of His identity, and we know about love from what we know of God. Uh, you might say God is power, and certainly when you think of the omnipotence of God, that He is all-powerful, uh, it strikes awe in our heart and our soul. When you think about the power displayed at creation, or the power of Christ to overcome death and to make that possible for us, certainly. Uh, so isn't it exciting compared with that, to just say he's unchanging? Uh, well, I think it might be. Uh, it takes a little bit more analyzing, a little bit more digging, but this is an exciting topic. Uh, a proper name or title for God would be He Who Is, or perhaps He Who Always Is. And when we use this phrase, God is He Who Always Is, we speak to His unchanging nature. We speak about the great consistency that God has. Uh, now, if you understand consistency, it really is a wonderful thing. It means to not change. Any amount of change would imply imperfection, uh, because change is either, to the greater extent, change to be more perfect to improve, or to the lesser extent, change that is to be less perfect, to depreciate. And so if you imagine uh, a graph, we're going to analyze it a little bit, let the horizontal of the graph be time. Let the vertical axis, uh, axis be perfection, if we could quantify it. And so as you're charting perfection over time, it moves. Uh, and that's our experience. Sometimes we get better. Sometimes we get worse. But it's the ups and downs of life. Now God, since He is unchanging, since He is all consistent, God cannot be any more perfect than He is. And he will never become any less perfect. God does not change. And so you don't see the ups and the downs. You see a straight line. Perfect consistency at the very top of the graph. God is always all perfect. It doesn't go down any because God never depreciates. He never gets worse. And it doesn't go up any because he doesn't have anywhere to go. God's at the very top. He is perfect. Uh, as we think about this idea, allow God to describe his unchanging nature through Scripture. In the book of Malachi chapter 3, we look specifically to verse 6, but a little bit in verse 7 as well. Malachi 3, 6 and 7, God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. 
Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. And so it opens with the principle, and it's a grand statement. I am the Lord, I do not change. Each one of those speaking to his identity. He's saying, this is who I am. You need to know me. God says, I am Lord. The word Yahweh, Jehovah, that which is perfect, that which is eternal. And he also says, I don't change. Just as important as it is to acknowledge God and know who God is, we must know He's unchanging. In context here in Malachi 3, He says, Therefore you are not consumed. And so what we're speaking about is that His mercy does not change. The fact that He's a loving, merciful God who will not strike out and consume a people when He has told them there's time to repent. And that's what He describes a little further. Return to Me and I will return to you. Uh, This is a wonderful thing because we don't just see it in God the Father. Uh, The word Jehovah or Yahweh used here talking about all parts of God. And we even have scripture in the New Testament speaking specifically to our Savior. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The unchanging nature of God seen in our Lord Jesus. And so whether you're graphing His perfection or His compassion, or His mercy, or His judgment, or His truth, fill in the blank, straight line. No ups, no downs, and mankind knows exactly what to expect expect of Him because He is unchanging. He is consistent. Uh, So if we're exploring deeper what it means that God is uh, unchanging, we have to first say He has unchanging character. Uh, And this is the first thing I want to really impress upon your minds. God's character does not change. There's a great verse found in the book of Leviticus, and the phrase here is actually repeated many times in Scripture, especially within the book of Leviticus. Uh, We find it in chapter 19 and verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Uh, We often just shorten this to say, Be holy, for I am holy. Uh, And that's what God says to His people. That's what He says during the time of the Old Testament. That's what He says today. Be holy, for I am holy. The unchanging nature of God. In His character, He is holiness. Uh, Just like where we saw in Malachi, I am the Lord, I do not change. Here in Leviticus, I am the Lord, I am holy. And He calls on His people to be holy as well. We see a similar concept in the book of Psalms from the 18th Psalm and verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. Part of God's character that does not change is He is trustworthy. This is such an important lesson for every one of us, not just to learn, but I think to hold close to our heart to always remember and remind ourselves of, God is trustworthy. And you can see it here in the image that the psalmist use. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. The action that you take when you block an attack with a shield is an action of great trust to say, this is going to save me. To say, this is going to prevent this attack from harming me, from hitting me, from doing the damage it's intended to do. We look to God in that way. He is our shield. We trust Him. And we're able to trust Him because of that flatline consistency. Because He doesn't change. He will never be less perfect. He will never diminish in any way. We can rest safe trusting in Him. Uh, If you look to the New Testament in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 4 and 5, a little further into the character of God. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Uh, Notice the descriptive language used here. To describe our God, who is rich in mercy. Now imagine for a minute if God's character was changing. Imagine for a minute if God were inconsistent. We would say He's rich in mercy today, but maybe not tomorrow. And this was life for anyone throughout the ages who would look to a man as his ruler. Imagine you live in an ancient kingdom and you have some request. You have to go before the king and ask him. Well, you want to wait till he's in a good mood. You want to wait till a day where he's rich in mercy and you'll make sure to go and run quickly then and say, could I please have this request granted? If you catch him in a good mood, the king will say yes. But our God 
is unchanging. Our God is consistent, and Scripture says He is rich in mercy. And you remember, He's trust, trustworthy. So we're not saying He's rich in mercy now. Hurry and go ask Him. Say, He is always rich in mercy. And we can trust that He will continually be the merciful, loving God that He is. It's a wondrous thing, the God that we serve. Notice verse 5, Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. So merciful, so loving to affect that change. And it's just as we spoke about during Bible class to go from the life of a sin servant, a life in wickedness, to the life of a servant of God, walking in the light, walking after the Spirit. And so, so much to like about this idea. God who is rich in mercy and He is unchanging in His character. We also see it in 1 John chapter 4. And this is one of those attributes of God so often talked about. 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Consistently, unchangingly, our God is love. Notice it doesn't say God is loving. Scripture is more precise than that. If we said God is loving, then it's something He does. But when we say God is love, it's part of who He is. It's part of His identity. Uh, We can expect, we can trust, we can be confident that our God never acts in hate. It is against His nature. It is against His identity. The unchanging character of God is one of love. Uh, Let me show you one more on this topic. Uh, It comes from the book of Revelation. Revelation 15 and verse 3. Uh, Part of the scene in heaven is a song of praise that is voiced to Jesus, voiced to the Savior. And it's very similar to the song that we see in the book of Exodus when the, the children of Israel come out of Egyptian bondage. And that's why you see this reference to Moses here. Revelation 15.3, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Uh, See the unchanging character of God here. As He's being praised, these worshipers say, Just and true are your ways, and they are always just, and they are always true. Uh, You know, every one of us has actions that we regret. Uh, Looking back, decisions, and we say, I never should have done that. I should have behaved differently. I went in the wrong way. But God is consistently just. Consistently, His ways are true. And so there's not some good and some not good. There's not hit and miss. There's not one day this way, another day that. God is unchanging in His just character. Uh, Now, as we go a little further, what does it mean that God is unchanging? He has unchanging promises. Uh, And to start on this point, I want to look to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, The unchanging promises of God seem to all be centered around the idea of life. Look at life here in this text. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 1. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. Uh, Now, definitely an Old Testament focus here. That's where we find this verse. Uh, And a focus, I think, specifically on the children of Israel, pointing toward the conquest of Canaan, the land which you shall possess. But strip it down to its bare bones and see the basic concept that's presented here in this verse. There are teachings presented. When you follow or observe those teachings, what is the result? You live. That concept, that premise we find here in God's Word is always present. It is the unchanging promise of God that if you come to Him and obey His teaching, you will have life. And it's always presented in that way. We can trust, we know that God consistently offers this promise. Uh, A verse that we saw not too long ago in our Sunday morning class, Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. Here Paul, as he writes to the church in Rome, references the fact that God's promises are unchanging by recalling the story of Abraham. In Romans 4.3 he says, What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In other words, there were teachings from God which he observed or followed, and the end result was life. To be described as righteous, walking in the light with God, walking in life, under the reign of life rather than under the reign of death. Jesus himself said in John 10 and verse 10, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
This is the unchanging promise of God. And remember the source. The one who has a consistent character says, I came for this reason. And as we said in the intro, since God is love and God is power or might, we know that He's able to accomplish this. To extend the abundant life for mankind. For anyone who will obey His teachings. It's a wonderful promise. And it's one that we can absolutely take to the bank. In James chapter 1 and verse 17, it's put this way. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Notice this last phrase. With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Uh, what does it mean that there's no variation or variableness? He doesn't change. No shadow of turning. You don't catch him on a bad day where he's not rich in mercy. God is always rich in mercy. You don't see him at a day where he's not just. He's always just. He doesn't regard you in a way of hate because he is love. And these promises are linked to his character. Notice every good gift, every perfect gift, anything that you and I could ever need or want, part of the promise that God extends for the good of our soul. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, we get a little further window into this picture. Part of his unchanging promise is the desire that this would be for all. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is God's wish for you? It is that you would live. You remember the root of this whole idea. There are teachings, when they are observed or followed, the result is life. The opposite of that would be to perish, would be to die, and God does not want that for anyone. There's a passage that fits right in with this. Uh, I wonder if you've heard me use the term before, a brother and sister verse. Uh, These verses that fit together work together. Uh, They always ought to be referenced together. Well, the sister verse to 2 Peter 3.9, I think is 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. These scriptures so alike in their teaching. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The same exact point, just coming at it from the opposite side. See, in 2 Peter, he doesn't want any to perish. So what does that mean? 1 Timothy 2, he wants all to be saved. That is God's desire. But the determining factor is whether or not we will obey. You remember the root of all of this. There are teachings. When they are observed, there is life. But if we break those teachings, those laws, if we do not observe those commandments, there will not result life. The unchanging promises of God are there. They're available to all, and God wants us all to take part in them. Uh, But there's one last lesson in this picture that needs to be addressed. Part of God's unchanging nature is that He has unchanging standards. The unchanging standards of God must be considered. Uh, Because no matter how much time we spend in God's Word, there still seem to be some who say, maybe God isn't so serious about all this. Maybe in the last great day, I can talk to Him. And I've heard some of this audacity. Maybe we can cut a deal at the end. No, His standards are unchanging. If you look to the first Psalm, Psalm 1 and verse 6, one that highlights the righteous man and how he lives. Verse 6 says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Take this in reverse order. The second part, the way of the ungodly shall perish. Very specific word. Not to say might perish, seems to be perishing, is pointing toward perishing. No, it shall happen. There's certainty that's there. Now take the first part. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. And the word for knows here describes not just to be aware of, cognizant of the way of the righteous, but to approve of, to look on and be familiar with it. He recognizes in the righteous something of himself. And so when we say the Lord knows the way of the righteous, he knows those who are walking in the standard that he himself has set. And it shall not change. Notice how strong that is stated. If you look to John 4, 24, a passage we reference a lot, God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. You see the same strength that it must be this way. 
Uh, but just prior, if you back up a verse, verse 23 says, The Father is seeking such to worship Him. Uh, now this is very important. God has unchanging standards. And so we say, what are you looking for, God? If we're to meet these standards, how can I measure up? Well, God is seeking people to worship in spirit and in truth. He is looking for, He is desiring people who not only will give Him their heart, but who will give them all of their life, all of their action, not to serve God and serve their own selfish interest at the same time, but to put to death everything of the world, everything of wickedness, everything of sin, and say, I give my all to the service of God. In this picture, we see worshiping, acknowledging, praising the Father, and living a life of service, one that is based on His teaching. That's what He's looking for. That's the standard. That's how we can know we measure up. And that standard will not change. It must be this way. Uh, Let me show you a great passage from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Uh, Now, Ezekiel is great because so often you'll see instructions laid out from God. And you might say, well, isn't all the Bible instructions? Well, yes, but in Ezekiel, so often, they are extended instructions, we might say, to go above and beyond. Uh, You don't need instructions to heat up a Pop-Tart. You open the box, you throw them in the toaster, there they are. Yet if you look on a box of Pop-Tarts, there are instructions there. In some ways, you might look at Ezekiel like that, to make it very basic, to make it very plain. Look here to chapter 33, Verse 18 and 19, it says, When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. You see how that's above and beyond in this description? We could just say the righteous turns from his righteousness. And we know what that means. He must have committed sin. But it includes that information as well. To commit iniquity. We already know that sin leads to death. That's presented in Scripture time and time again. But it's contained here as well. To be very complete in this instruction, and what exactly happens when the righteous one turns from his righteousness, commits iniquity, that leads to death. Then look at verse 19. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Once again, very thorough. If the wicked one turns from his wickedness, we know what he did. But Scripture tells us anyway, to do what is lawful to do what is right. And that says there must be a standard. If there is something right, if there is something lawful, God must have prescribed that. Yes, absolutely. He shall live because of it. Clear instructions where God says, this is the rule. And knowing God, knowing His character, knowing His promises, knowing His unchanging nature, that will always be the rule. You remember the root that we had. The root of all of this is that there are teachings, when they are observed, it leads to life. The same principle here in this verse. God is wonderfully consistent. And you can see again, no change in His standards. And so it makes no sense to come to Him on the last great day and say, well, I know you said this, but couldn't we do this instead? Or for allow someone to come and tell you, yeah, the Bible says that's wrong, but really it's not. Foolishness to say that God will change in that way. Uh, if you look to Romans 6 and verse 16, This is a great verse about the end result. What's down that path? Romans 6.16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Because God has unchanging standards, we benefit. We benefit so greatly because unchanging standards means that we know the end result. Because God has already outlined the plan, the grading rubric, if you will, to say, I know how that works out. I know what is required. I know how the system works. God is unchanging. Uh, In Matthew 7, we get to see someone try to answer this, try to say, well, maybe we can get by anyway. Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Uh, Pause there. You remember the root cause of all this. There's a teaching... When it's observed, you shall live. That's what's presented there, to do the will of the Father. Okay, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? See, trying to make a deal, trying to say, well, it's got to be okay. Verse 23. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
if you allow me to paraphrase verse 23, I can't accept you because you didn't follow the rules. You didn't meet the standard. The unchanging, consistent standard, which is merciful, which is loving, which has been fully voiced and laid out for mankind to follow. And you come and try and work around that picture. God is consistent. His standards do not change. One more verse here for this morning. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. I especially like this verse, not just for how it relates to standards, but I think our entire lesson is found right here. Look at it with me. 2 Timothy 4 eight. Paul writing here says, Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. All of verse 8 is rooted, anchored, to the idea that God does not change. That God is consistent. You take it piece by piece. He says, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. That is a promise. An unchanging promise from Almighty God. And then he talks about God. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. That's God's character. And it is unchanging that He is a righteous judge. That's a key part of His identity, His character. And the last part, not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. There's the standard. Do you love His appearing? Are you a believer? Have you obeyed the teaching that is handed down from God? Can you see it all in that verse? God has an unchanging nature. He has unchanging promises. And He has unchanging standards. This is where you and I put our hope. This is where our faith is anchored, that our God is consistent. Uh, There are many words that we could use, just like we said at the outset, to describe God. And it's certainly true to say God is loving, or to say God is power, or God is might. But I want you to consider, now that we've examined it from Scripture, just how much a blessing it is that our God is unchanging. You remember, He is the God who is. He is and always is wonderfully consistent. Uh, You can turn a nice phrase, God is perfectly consistent and consistently perfect. That's how our Lord exists and always will exist. God cannot be any more perfect and He will never become any less perfect. He doesn't change and that is to our benefit. That is a spiritual jackpot for every human individual for the state of our eternal soul. God's character remains loving, just, merciful, righteous. God's promises do not change. He extends life to all who will obey Him. He always blesses the obedient. And God's standards are set in stone. God will never look on evil and call it good. And in the same way, God will never look on good and call it evil. He punishes wickedness and disobedience because of His nature, because He is just, and He rewards submissive devotion to all those who put their trust in Him. Our God is wonderful. Our God is awesome in the truest sense of the word. And I think every one of us should thank Him daily for His unchanging nature. Uh, If you have any need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, uh, we would invite you to do that. If you have some need that you would like the prayers of the congregation about, uh, we stand ready to serve and assist in any way that we can. Uh, If we can help at all, please let us know. As together we stand and sing.